Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm Emmanuel, I'm an airline pilot and today let's do a video on how a real world pilot judges and rates their landing. I can tell you that much, it does not involve any landing rate monitor or any feet per minute indication. But before we dive into the practical term of things, let's quickly explain where we are and what we are about to do. So we are currently on the final turn towards Leeds Bradford's runway 14 in the United Kingdom. Now, I picked this particular approach for two reasons. Number one, if we have a look at the runway itself, we can see it's rather short. It's 2250 meters and it features a displaced threshold. So, if we have a look down here, from the displaced threshold, we've only got 1801 meters of landing run. In order to make things a little bit more interesting even, if we now have a look into our approach, we can see that the ILS approach to runway 14 actually features a 3.5 degree glide slope and thereby increases our rate of descent on the approach. The reason why I went for this particular approach is as follows. First of all we got a short runway and secondly we got a steeper than normal approach. However contrary to public belief that does not make any difference as to what a good landing is. So a couple of prerequisites for what we've chosen for the approach. We are going to start with a flat 40 landing and we also got the auto brake selected to max. So that's our basics of which we are going to start. And I just see that the speed has adjusted a knot since I selected it, so let's reselect it. So flex 40 landing, auto brake max is our prerequisites for the landing. Now, starting from here, let's have a look into a couple of basics of how we are going to fly an approach like this. We're going to start with a little bit of information here from the Boeing manuals and I'll also give you a reference from the Airbus manuals a little bit later so that you get the full picture. Now this is going to be a couple minutes of theory now so I can relieve you at the end of it I'm going to make a quick summary of the most important points but I want you to be able to get the full picture so that you can do the full judgment. A good landing starts with a stabilized approach. Now what is the stabilized approach and when do we have to achieve it? A stabilized approach means that passing the landing gate, which is 500 feet in VMC or 1000 feet in IMC in the Boeing 737 or 1000 feet at all times in the A330, that's the two types I'm flying. So at 500 in VMC, so in visual conditions, runway in sight, or at 1000 foot in IMC, we need to have achieved the following numbers. The speed be needs to be between VREF and VREF plus 15 with a maximum speed of VREF plus 20. Note that at this point VREF actually refers to the speed that we got down here. So VREF 134. Now this can be all the way up to 149 as normal approach speed with sufficient headwind. Re refer to my video on the wind correction as applicable and a maximum of zero plus 20, so the maximum is 154 knots. If the speed is higher than that, it's an unstabilized approach, we need to go around. So that's the speed that we need to take into consideration over here. Going on from there, we have to vertically and laterally be on the glide path or localizer, which means plus minus one dot of deviation or three reds or three whites on the puppies. Now, there's a little trick over there for pilots that you can do, but that you should take into consideration when judging your landing later on. That is, often the puppy and the glide slope do not exactly coincide with one another, so you can visually transition from one to the other as long as you're flying a stabilized approach, so as long as all the other criteria are within limits. But in the aftermath of the landing, think about whether what you did was the right thing or just the legal thing. Likewise, if you're flying a non-precision approach, vertically we have to be within plus minus 75 feet or 3 reds or 3 watts on the puppy. And laterally we have to be on the center line, which equals half the RMP value. The appropriate thrust needs to be set, the landing checklist has to be completed, and the vertical speed is proportional to the current ground speed, but not more than 1000 feet per minute unless briefed prior to the approach. Now the latter point becomes important on the approach we're going to fly today. As we have a 3.5 degree glide slope, you can see that at 140 knots, our target descent rate is going to be almost 900 feet a minute already. And if we fly a couple of knots faster, then it can rapidly approach the 1000. So today, with that approach, 1000 feet a limit, 
or 1,000 feet a minute is not going to be a hard criteria for a go around, but like 1,100, 1,200 is acceptable. In the A330, we use 1,200 at all times even. So that is the approach angle that we've taken in consideration today. So we are going to have a rather high rate of descent. Now, going on from there though, we can take things a little bit further and we can have a look at some more parameters. So that is the Boeing side of things of the stabilized approach. All of those need to be met by the landing gate. In Airbuses, it's quite similar, just that you don't have Vera to Vera plus 15, but you have to be within your ground speed mini target, which is going to be varied automatically depending on the winds. Okay, so with that taken into consideration, let's now have a look at the actual landing technique. Now, here is another common misconception and one that even real pilots refer to all the time, but that is not really correct to do. And that is looking at the aiming point on the runway. The aiming point is just a marker on the runway. It is not the ideal touchdown point. That is very important here, guys. If you've got a short runway like we have right now with just 1,800 meters, then a touchdown before that may be appropriate. However, the exact point of touchdown is not defined by any marking on the runway, but it is actually de defined by the time in the flare. So Airbus defines this as 7 seconds between overflying the runway threshold at 50 feet and touchdown. Now these 7 seconds also explain why in case of failures, for example, that require a fast approach speed like a flap failure, the landing distance becomes so incredibly long. If you approach at 180 knots and you take 7 seconds for that flare, you're going to touch down much further beyond the runway at a much higher speed. Whether if you approach at a very slow speed, for example when doing a ferry flight, it can be as low as 120 knots. So then the aiming point might be a little bit behind the optimal landing point. So 7 seconds in the A330 and Boeing talks of between 4 and 8 seconds. So again you can see some differences between aircraft manufacturers but the general technique still remains the same. So let's now have a look at what Boeing tells us about the flare and touchdown in the flight crew training manual. Boeing basically says that the techniques discussed in here are applicable to all landings including one engine and operative landings, crosswind landings and landings on slippery runway unless an unexpected or sudden event occurs, such as wind shear or collision avoidance situation, it is not appropriate to use sudden, violent or abrupt control inputs during landing. Begin with a stabilized approach on speed, in trim and on glide path. Note when a manual landing is planned from an approach with the autopilot engaged, the transition to manual flight should be planned early enough to allow the pilot time to establish airplane control before beginning the flare. The pilot flying should consider disengaging the autopilot and disconnecting the autothrottle 1 to 2 nautical miles before the threshold or approximately 300 to 600 feet above field elevation. Note that this should be considered as a latest point to disengage the automatics for a manual landing. When the threshold passes under the nose of the airplane, shift the visual sighting point to the far end of the runway. Shifting with the visual sighting point assists in controlling the pitch attitude during the flare. Maintain a constant airspeed and descent rate assists in determining the flare point. Initiate the flare when the main gear is approximately 20 feet above the runway by increasing pitch attitude approximately 2 to 3 degrees. This slows the rate of descent. After the flare is initiated, smoothly retard the thrust levers to idle, make small pitch attitude adjustments to maintain the desired descent rate to the runway, a smooth thrust reduction to idle also assists in controlling the natural nose down pitch change associated with thrust reduction. Hold sufficient back pressure on the control column to keep the pitch attitude constant, a touchdown attitude of approximately 2 to 4 degrees pitch with an airspeed of approximately VREF if ideal. Ideally, main gear touchdown should occur simultaneously with thrust levers reaching idle. Avoid rapid control color movements during the flare. If the flare is too abrupt and thrust is excessive near touchdown, the airplane tends to float in ground effect. Do not allow the airplane to float or attempt to hold it off. Fly the airplane onto the runway at the desired touchdown point and at the desired speed. So you can see that there is no mention at all of that aiming point. And there's likewise no mention at all of the rate of descent at touchdown. 
Now, if we have a look into the landing flare profile described in the 737 flight crew training manual, then the following conditions are assumed. A 3 degree approach glide path, flare distance approximately 1 to 2000 feet beyond the threshold, so that's kind of your landing distance that they expect you to do, to use, like 1 or 2000 feet beyond the threshold. Typical landing flare times range from 4 to 8 seconds and are a function of approach speed. And the airplane body attitudes are based upon typical landing weights, flap 30, Vera 30 plus 5 for the approach and Vera 30 plus 0 for touchdown and should be reduced by about 1 degree for each 5 knots above this speed. So remember typical attitudes 2 to 4 degrees. Now the threshold height for main gear and pilot eye level is shown basically by um, 50 degrees above the threshold unless otherwise specified in the chart. Alright, so normal touchdown attitude then is about 2 to 4 degrees and the speed should be approximately VREF. But speed at VREF minus 5 perfectly acceptable as well. The important thing is to look outside the window for your flare. That's the most important thing there. Now that's the Boeing guidance. Let's also have a quick look into some Airbus guidance in order to get the full idea. And then we're going to shoot this approach and I'm going to tell you a couple of things about the approach as we fly it. So this is from the Airbus A330 now. When passing 100 feet radio altitude, auto trim ceases and the pitch law is modified to be a full authority pitch direct law. Indeed, the normal pitch law which provides trajectory stability would not be well adapted to the flare maneuver. At 50 feet a slight pitch down elevator order is applied, consequently the pilot will have to move the stick rearwards so as to reproduce conventional aircraft aerodynamic characteristics. The flare technique is thus very conventional. Prior to flare, avoid destabilization of the approach and steepening the slope at low heights in an attempt to target a shorter touchdown. If a normal touchdown point cannot be achieved or if destabilization occurs just prior to the flare, a go around or rejected landing should be performed. The pilot monitoring monitors the rate of descent and should call sink rate if the vertical speed is excessive prior to the flare. From stabilized conditions, the, fl the flare height is about 40 feet. Again, A330 that is. This height varies due to the range of typical operational conditions that can directly influence the rate of descent. Compared to typical sea level flare heights for flat and adequate runway length, pilots need to be aware of factors that will require an earlier flare such as high airport elevation, steeper approach slope compared to the nominal 3 degrees, tailwind or increasing runway slope. Note that the cumulative effect of any of the above factors combined for one approach will require even more anticipation to perform an earlier flare. If the flare is initiated too late or below 25 feet, then the pitch change will not have sufficient time to allow the necessary change to aircraft trajectory. Late, weak or released flare inputs increase the risk of a hard landing. The rate of descent must be controlled prior to the initiation of the flare. Start the flare with positive or prompt back pressure on the side stick and holding as necessary. Avoid significant forward stick movement once flare is initiated. At 20 foot the retard auto callout reminds the pilot to retard thrust levers. It is a reminder rather than an order. When best adapted the pilot will rapidly retard all thrust levers. Depending on the conditions the pilot will retard earlier or later. However the pilot must ensure that all thrust levers are at idle detent at the latest at touchdown to ensure ground spoiler extension at touchdown. In order to assess the rate of descent in the flare and the aircraft position relative to the ground look well ahead of the aircraft, the typical pitch increment in the flare is approximately 2.3 degrees, which leads to a minus 1 degree flight path angle associated with a 10 knot speed decay in the maneuver. Do not allow the aircraft to float or do not attempt to exceed the or to extend the flare by increasing pitch attitude in an attempt to achieve a perfectly smooth touchdown. A prolonged float will increase both the landing distance and the risk of tail strike. After touchdown, the pilot must fly the nose wheel smoothly but without delay onto the runway and must be ready to counteract any residual pitch up effect on of the ground spoilers. However, the main part of the spoiler pitch up effect is compensated by the flight control law itself. It is not recommended to keep the nose high in order to increase aircraft drag during the initial part of the rollout as this technique is inefficient and increases the risk of tail strike. During the derotation, it is normal to feel three successive shocks or contacts with the ground. Yes, that's the actual words that Airbus uses in the flight crew techniques manual. The first from the aft wheels of the main landing gear boogie, the second from the front wheels, and the third from the nose landing gear. 
So, to summarize, what Airbus says over here is the objectives of the lateral and directional control of the aircraft during the flare are to land on the center line and to minimize the lateral loads on the main landing gear. The recommended decrep technique is used to all of the following. The rudder to align the aircraft with the runway during the flare. The roll control if needed to maintain the aircraft on the runway center line. Any tendency to drift downwind should be counteracted by an appropriate lateral roll input to the side stick. In case of a strong crosswind, in the decrep phase the pilot flying should be prepared to add small bank angle into the wind in order to maintain the aircraft on the runway center line. The aircraft may be landed with a partial decrep to prevent excessive bank. This technique prevents wingtip or engine cell strike caused by an excessive bank angle. As a consequence, this may result in touchdown with some bank angle into the wind, hence with the upwind landing gear first. So that is what Boeing and Airbus have to say about the landing techniques. That was a lot of theory, so let's try to put it into simple words before executing the approach. Put into simple words, what we can say is the following. We need to achieve a stabilized approach, that means don't speed on the approach, and latest by the stable gate, 500 in VMC, 1000 in IMC on the Boeings, 1000 at all times in the Airbus. We need to be stabilized with an appropriate thrust set and the landing checklist completed. Now, when initiating the flare, we don't aim for what is commonly called the aiming point, but we actually aim for simply flaring the plane and touching down on time. For that it is important that we follow the glide slope accurately so as to cross the runway threshold at 50 feet. However, do not chase the glide slope at very low altitudes as that can result in a very high sink rate and thereby increase the risk of a hard landing. The flare should not be prolonged but a smooth touchdown is not a target either. So. Especially on a landing like we are about to do it today, 1800 meters of runway and a 3.5 degree approach slope, the aim is not to do a perfectly smooth landing. The aim is to touch down at the appropriate time, 4 to 8 seconds after the beginning of the flare, and to get the spoilers and the reverses out to start decelerating the airplane quickly. Therefore, in order to rate how good your landing actually was, you need to take into consideration the entire thing from the approach basically from the moment you intercept the glide slope, which is why I started the flight at this very point, all the way to the point where you are actually going to touch down. So with that much theory now discussed, let's go ahead and go out of the active pause and we'll go straight into the approach. We're nearing 10 miles, so let's go ahead and start configuring the airplane. We're also going to arm approach mode so that we can capture the ILS in a few moments. So. The first thing for us to notice over here is that we are approaching an airfield that's located at a 600 foot elevation. So in order to judge your height, since we are flying over hilly terrain outside as you can see, we are not going to reference the radio altimeter, but instead we're going to reference the primary altimeter. So we got our white line on here that marks 1000 foot above the field elevation, and then we got our amber line which marks 500 foot above the field elevation. And that's the data that we are going to rely upon in order to judge our height above the runway. So we got Volok capture, set runway heading 138, and that's now set. Now we can give ourselves a little bit of time until the glide slope comes alive, then we are going to slow down to the flux 5 speed, and like that we are going to fly a nice and stable approach. The approach lights are coming inside, just over there, so everything's looking good. Glide slope alive, flaps 5, and here we go, speed target is selected down, speed brakes armed, and let's do as much as we can now. So, landing lights are supposed to come only when the landing clearance is received, start switches we can already do now, likewise the recall. Okay, very good. So, with that, we have done pretty much everything we could. Let's now go ahead and disconnect the automatics, and we're going to go straight into a manual approach sequence from here. Right, manual thrust, manual controls, door on altitude is set, airplane is stabilized, thrust idle, looking very good. So we are going to apply the normal low drag approach technique that my company always used to use on the Boeing 737 and that means we are going to start extending our landing gear and configuring for landing at 5 nautical miles. Now that actually makes the approach 
seem quite rushed if you're not used to it, but once you're used to it, it actually makes things, well, not much more difficult than the 1000 foot stabilized technique that we now use on the Airbus. Okay, approaching 4 miles, let's go gear down, flaps 15, speed can come down. But remember, we're on a 3.5 degree glide, so the, airport, or the airplane is not going to slow down as nicely as it um, would normally do on a uh, standard 3 degree slow. Okay, flaps 25. Remember, we planned uh, flaps 40 landing. Make sure to keep the plane on the glide, that's a factor for um, judging your approach and your landing later on. So try to stay stabilized on here. But remember, at 160 knots, we already need a 1000 foot a minute rate of descent. For that reason, it's totally acceptable to descend a bit faster now. Okay, flex 40, set VRF plus 5. And again, check, remember to stay within the stabilized approach techniques at all times. Okay, we'll assume that our first officer has read the landing checklist for us. We're approaching the landing gate down here. And you can see we are within the specified limits of our operation. So we are within half a dot of it on the glide slope. Our rate of descent slightly above a thousand is acceptable right now due to the fact we briefed it prior to the approach. Now you can see the runway coming up ahead. Now we've got the display threshold over here. Over the display we want to be in 50 feet. Check. So that is what we're going to aim for next. Continue. Yeah, that is acceptable, at least in the PMDG it is. 50, 40, okay. 30, Idle, 40, flare, don't prolong 10. the flare, just put it down right in the end. touchdown zone. Okay, very good. So, speed break up, thrust as normal, keep it on the center line, slow it down, and that's it guys. That's about as easy as it gets. So, in the aftermath, how would we rate this landing then? Well, let's give it a go. So, the approach itself was stabilized, even though we varied slightly up and down over the glide slope. So, everything was fine within the stabilized approach criteria, but a little bit of an up and down there. So, not the full point for the approach. However, we met all the targets, so we can give that a fair 9 out of 10. Then, when we passed our landing threshold, you, you could see on the final there, the glide slope tended to get uh, somewhat unreliable and that's what I meant with don't chase it down on the very last part of the final. So that that sink rate warning that we got from the airplane there, the PMDG is a little bit excessive so I would not count that, I would not take that into consideration, I would ignore that because the PMDG is a little bit more sensitive there. So in my opinion that was within limits, especially since we briefed that a thousand feet a minute might temporarily be exceeded there. We had like 200 feet a minute more than the normal sink rate. The normal would have been 900 we said, we had 1100. Now that's acceptable in my opinion. Think of a normal 3 degree glide slope, you approach with uh, 700 feet a minute, you had 200 more, 900, fine. So not a problem. We can continue off that. Now, going on from there, we flat the airplane a little high maybe. I might have flat it 10 foot too early, but I wanted to break that rate of descent that we had earlier from the um, slightly steeper approach that we did. So I would say that was okay. Now the actual flare time, you guys gotta go back in the live stream and count the seconds. It has to be between 4 and 8 for it to be ideal according to Boeing. Now what I can say is that we touched down well within the touchdown zone and we had a perfectly smooth touchdown for what it was. Probably some of you are going to look at the vertical speed indicator now and say like, no, that was much too hard or stuff like that. I tend to say, no, it wasn't. It was perfectly fine according to the ideal landing criteria by both Airbus and Boeing. So for the touchdown itself, I'd apply the full point since we flared, we held the attitude and we just flew the airplane down onto the runway, exactly as you're supposed to. So touchdown rate, like many flights are must taken into account, doesn't really count. That's not the ideal technique that you're supposed to use. In an ideal case, if you've got a long runway, obviously you can make it a little bit smoother for your passengers. I'm fairly sure we stayed under those eight seconds that we are allowed to take. So you can make it a bit smoother. 
But keep in mind, I chose a 1,800 meters runway for the particular case over here that we do want to make the touchline a little bit more firm. And even though many flight simulation landing trackers would now tell you, oh, bad landing, bad touchdown. In my opinion, it was a perfect touchdown. And that is ultimately the reason I made this video, to give you an idea of how to rate and judge your landings without the need for any third-party tools, because those third-party tools in flight simulation, they typically lie to you. And that's it for this video. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, do let me know in the comments below. I'm very much looking forward to that. And with that, I'd now like to say thank you very much for watching. If you did indeed like the video, then be sure to leave a like in YouTube as well, as it does help with the algorithms. If you're up for more, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And if you really love what I'm doing, I would appreciate a small donation through the Buy Me Coffee link in the video description below. Thank you for watching, and I see you all again on the next one.